I'm going to squat down. But just to start out, I was at breakfast this morning, and the speaker said that there was 87 distinguished experts here, and 55 of them had a PhD, so I don't fit into any of those categories. So uh, like Eric said, whatever I tell you, I'm sure it's going to change, but I'm going to uh, try to tell you the experience that, that we had this year. Uh, my name's Robert Gray, and I farm in western Kentucky. And uh, we raise corn, wheat, beans, uh, got some cattle, and we, we kind of have an emphasis on tobacco as well. And that's one reason why we, we tried this hemp uh, is because it fits so well into a tobacco rotation. Uh, don't, has anybody ever raised tobacco in here? So, well, you know the, the labor demands and then the infrastructure demands and things like that. So, so transitioning to hemp was, was, was fairly easy for us. Uh, we raised about 400 acres of tobacco and, and we ended up raising about 12 acres of hemp. So not a big transition, we just kind of stuck my toe in instead of jump, jumping in neck deep. But it's, it's um, as Eric said, it, it's kind of like the gold rush. And, and everybody's chasing this, this dream of these, you know, two acres making $50,000 an acre. And it's, it's really, it's been a challenge. Uh, but going back to the tobacco, how it fits in with this tobacco rotation, there's probably uh, two keys to, to raising hemp. Uh, the number one problem with raising hemp is you've got to have a processor that's going to partner with you and it's going to pay you when you get done. Uh, all the meetings I've been in this morning, everybody's talking about how we can irrigate better and cheaper and, and seed selection and produce more soybeans, produce more cotton or whatever it is. And we get all the production up. We don't worry about it. We throw it in the truck. We haul it to the elevator. Chicago says it's his price, they write us a check, you're done. Hemp, that's not the case. You do all the work, you haul it to the processor, and he says, I'll pay you when I get some money. So uh, before you jump in, a lot of times they don't get the money, because one thing about hemp that, that Eric didn't mention is it's, it's the FDIC, the banking reg regulations haven't kept up with production. So you can't go to the bank and borrow money for hemp. And the processors can't borrow money as well. So this is all, it's uh, cash money, I mean, you've got to fund it from somebody else, venture capital, whatever, but if I, if I want to produce CBD oil, I can't go to the bank and say, hey, here's my, my business model, I need $2 million to pay my suppliers and get this equipment and all, it doesn't happen. It's cash money out of your pocket. So when these guys are getting $50,000 an acre, how many, how many acres of checks does a guy that's going to buy your hemp really have? And that's, that's a huge consideration. The other consideration that's, that's really important is it's so labor intensive. Uh, you know, there's no, we don't use any chemicals, there's nothing that's labeled that I know of to, to spray on hemp for, for weeds, herbicides, or uh, insecticides. So anything you do is gonna be manual labor. Uh, back, kind of going back to the tobacco is, with the tobacco we use H2A workers, migrant workers. So we've got the workers on the farm and that allows us to, to kind of transition back and forth from the hemp to the tobacco. And when we're not in the tobacco, then those guys can work in the hemp. So it, it really worked out there, well there. But uh, uh, to kind of go back, just to walk you through what I did, um, back when this hemp graze was going on last February, I said, you know, I don't know if I've got the, got the guts to go up here and, and spend $6,000 an acre on plants, and then this guy not pay me. That's not going to work out well. Somebody, we're going to have a falling out here somewhere. So I was really, I wasn't too excited about raising the hemp. There were some of my neighbors had done it. A uh, few of them had gotten paid. Some of them hadn't, but they thought they were going to get paid any time, any day now. Uh, and I just really, you know, what we were doing was working well on the farm. I said, I'm not sure that's really something that we want to, you know, we need to get into. Uh, as it turned out, uh, I worked with Eric's company, Genomera, and they came up with a program that said, hey, Robert, we're going to give you the plants, and then we're going to pay you to produce it. And then in the end, you bring us the product. If we're able to, to extract the product and sell that product, then we're going to pay you X amount of dollars on top of that, and we'll pay you by the pound or however that works. So uh, when, when they did that and, and another company I worked with came up with a, a similar program, we decided to, to try it. Uh, like I said, we had 12 acres out of 400 that were dedicated to tobacco, so it was, it was not a big deal. If it didn't work out, it wasn't like you were going to lose the farm. But what you see here, clones, uh, there's, there's two ways that you can, can set the hemp, plant the hemp. Clones are produced. They produce them in greenhouses. Uh, 
They're all cloned off the mother plant. They're all supposed to be identical. They're all female plants. Uh, you know, I've, they run in price from from two, three, four dollars a plant, just depending on. Uh, they're probably a dollar in August and four dollars in May. I don't just depending on how, how the market works. Uh, you can also buy what they call a certified seed or, or, or a clean seed that's supposed to be uh, all female plants, and then you put those in the greenhouse and, and transplant them. The people that have done that uh, have been semi-successful with it. Uh, what you have to do is go out there and manually remove the male plants from the field. Uh, that seed is certified with 85, 90% pure Eric, is that right? Something, somewhere in that sounds, range. Sounds so, better than others, yeah. But anyway, but you don't, uh, you really don't know what you're getting. The market's so new and evolving so fast, and this guy tells you, hey, man, my seed's 100%. Uh, and this guy said, mine's 99, and when you get it in the field, it, it's probably more like 80%. Uh, it's just, because it is so new, you really don't know what you're getting. We opted to go with the clones. Uh, the cl the, with the clones, too, the companies know what genetics they've got. I personally think that for the uh, for this to be sustainable, the genetics is probably going to be a, a key factor in this. Uh, you know, Eric mentioned the uh, the 0.3 on the on the THC content that that can change so fast, weather, time in the field, things like that, that we're going to have to have breed that into the to the plant in order to keep that level down and, and to produce the the most pounds per acre that we can do. Uh, but anyway, we take those clones and we put them in a, we call it a, a setter. It's the same thing you would transplant vegetables with or, or anything like that. One man rides per row and they, those clones are in that train, they take them and they put them in a little cup, it spins around and drops them in the ground. Uh, and we set them out and this is kind of what you come up with. These, these clones here probably been out, I'm gonna say four to five weeks. Uh, let me back up too. Uh, so because there's no herbicides that you can use, we, we ripped the ground in the fall, subsoil the ground in the fall, and then we came back and worked it two or three times with a field cultivator just to try to get it as clean as, as we could get the field. Uh, so we go in there, we get them set. When the plants get up, it normally takes, I don't know, seven to 10 days for them to kind of take hold and take off. Um, you can see on this farm, they've got drip tape irrigation running down the road. Um, that, that's an option. Uh, we did not personally do that. Well, we, our area, geographically, we normally get a pretty good amount of rainfall. Uh, there's not a lot of irrigation where we live. So uh, we're, we're able to, Mother Nature's normally able to take care of the plant. But once you get the plant set, then we'll come in there with a, with a cultivator, buffalo cultivator is what we had, and uh, we'll, we'll start, start cultivating after, I don't know, probably two weeks just to try to keep the field clean. And then, uh, after you cultivate, then you have to come in there by hand with hose like you do your garden and manually chop out in between the rows. So hemp's normally, uh, on plants per acre, you're anywhere probably from 1,600 to 2,400 is probably the range. Uh, we, we set 2,000 plants per acre, just had to start somewhere to kind of figure out where you want to be. But at 2,000 plants per acre on 40 inch row centers, it's about 60, 64 inches in between plants. So you don't get a lot of shading early on. So manually chopping it out is something that you're gonna do. Uh, this farmer here, instead of doing that, opted for, for putting them on plastic. And this works well, uh, but you have to irrigate it. So once you have that plastic, you've got to run the drip tape underneath that plastic. And they came in and mowed in between the rows. Um, you know, there's, like I said, there's a million ways to, to get the home plate in this industry and everybody's gonna do it a little bit different, but it's, no matter what you do, the, the, the labor part of it is a, is a real, real trick. Uh, you can look here, these are, this is two different varieties of the back, and this kind of shows you, this was actually one of our fields, uh, and these plants, came from one of our processors and they, they promised me that it was 100% all female plants off the same clone, same mother plant and everything. Uh, and this is what we came up with. I mean, there's no doubt, I guess, I don't know if you can see it in the back, but it was two different varieties. Uh, and that's just, I mean, that's the way the industry is. Uh, it was, 
an honest mistake. It, it all worked out, worked out good, but that's kind of what you get into. Uh, the, the, the pure seed is not, not so pure. It's just we haven't gotten there yet. Um, but you can see here, we, we never irrigated this. Uh, uh, you kind of see we plowed it out here, but there's not, you don't see many weeds out there. So we probably uh, cultivated and chopped it out. I so said, we, we set the hemp, I'm gonna say the 25th of May, 20, 25th of May, something like that. Uh, this is probably the 15th of July. And by this point, it's gotten too large to cultivate mechanically anymore. Uh, and, and pretty much when we got to that point, it's mother nature does her thing. We, we didn't really uh, do a lot in the field between probably the 10th, 15th of July and then when we started harvesting about the 15th of September. Uh, what about overhead irrigation? That's definitely an option and it would work very well. We don't, where we are, we don't have a lot of, we've got to go really deep to get water. So we don't have a lot of pivot irrigation or overhead irrigation. Um, if people that irrigate in our area, they'll have a, a pond or dig a lake and they'll pump, they'll run those uh, hose reels a lot, stuff like that to irrigate tobacco, but there's not, uh, we probably got, a, I don't know, 1% of the farmland is probably irrigated, but, but it, it would definitely work well. I mean, that wouldn't be a problem at all. Here you can see this hemp. It's probably, uh, I'm gonna say that's the first middle of August, just looking at the corn, but it, it's getting on up. It's probably getting up four to five feet tall. Uh, and at this point is when the hemp's gonna start putting on the floral material. And that's really what we want. Um, you can see here, this is these, this plant's got some, some disease in it, some foliar disease. There's actually a worm down here, I think you can kind of see. One thing we weren't expecting, uh, or I didn't think about when we, when we planted the crop was, uh, you know, I thought insects and things, but worms really took a toll on, on a lot of crops. Uh, and it looked like the, it was, it was no problem, no problem, no problem, and all of a sudden, boom, it hit, and it was a huge problem and the, the worms ate up a lot of, a lot of hemp in our area. And it looked like the guys had tried to leave it out, and, and it, the longer you left it out, then the more they ate up. It was kind of a, if you got in there and got a cut, it was, it was, it was really dumb luck because we didn't, we didn't know. Uh, but, so, just like any crop, it's, it's uh, everybody wants to make the most pounds, bushels, whatever we can per acre, and with the hemp, the longer you leave it out, the more pounds of floral material it'll produce. But on the, on the hind side of that, on the back side of that, the longer you leave it out, the higher the THC content goes up. So it's kind of a catch-22. Uh, like Eric mentioned, we've got to have that THC content below 0.3. So in the state of Kentucky, you call the Department of Agriculture, they come out, uh, they, I, they have a formula, it might be the fourth row, 10 plants in that they, but they have a, a, a form of whoever they check this plant and they come out and they, they cut one of the buds off the top and they send it off and they tell you, it usually takes about seven to 10 days to get the results back and they'll tell you, hey, that was uh, tested 0.2 or 0.5 or whatever that is and, and then you can kind of make a decision uh, where to go. Back up to that one screen with the two different varieties, Eric, if you can. So right here, we test, they tested this. These two varieties on either side came back at 0.2, and this variety in the middle came back at 0.4. So 0.4 is too hot, and in the state of Kentucky, you have the option of harvesting it and testing it again or destroying the crop. So I don't think any was, I don't believe any crops were destroyed at all. Do you know of any? I don't, know. I don't think anybody destroyed any crops in Kentucky, so everybody took it to harvest, and then, uh, what we did after we processed it, we went back and retested it and the test came back and lowered it down. But um, So once we get to the middle of September, we're gonna call the Department of Agriculture, they come out and test it, and then we're gonna start harvesting it. Uh, anybody know what a tobacco knife is? It's a, so we can call it a tobacco knife. It looks like a hatchet, but it's about that long. It's a, it's a real thin blade. And you take the plant, we take tobacco plants, you hold the plant and you cut it at the base and we put, six tobacco plants on a stick. With the hemp, we use the exact same knife, uh, walk down through there, once again, manual labor, and we cut the plants, 
and we actually threw them on a cotton wagon. Uh, we cut the sides off some cotton wagons that we used for tobacco, so we used the same things. Uh, we cut it, threw it on a wagon, and then I hauled mine to a greenhouse. And uh, this is, we have these greenhouses to raise tobacco seedlings, and so we take the tobacco out the first of May, and so they sit empty the rest of the year, so it worked out good. We didn't have any infrastructure costs or things like that, but we just threw it in there. We piled it on the wagons, we pulled the wagons down the side, you can see the curtains come down, and, we packed it in there and just kind of, uh, we kind of shingled it down through there just to have some kind of order, but, but really we just piled it in there. Uh, these guys over here, they hung it up to use be to better utilize the space, um, you know, which works great. Just, it's more labor intensive. We had enough greenhouse room uh, to put, you know, put the entire 12 acres in so we didn't have to worry about hanging it up. A, a lot of people, uh, what they'll do too on this greenhouse They'll come in there and fill it up, and they'll let it sit for two or three days. Then they'll take this side here, and they'll pile it up on this side. And they'll pile it all the way up to the roof, and they'll put a new, go and cut again. You know, if they'll cut two or three acres and put it in, wait two or three days, and they'll come in and put two or three more acres in there and let it dry because it takes about three to four days to, to get it to where it, you don't have any problem with it molding or rotting, in a, as long as the sun's out in the greenhouses. So... Uh, that's one way to do it. A lot, some other guys uh, down the road from us, they cut it, and I guess I guess everybody was dry around here, but we didn't have any rain from first of August till the first of October, and they cut it in the field and just let it lay in the field, and they left it laying in the field for probably five or six days, dried it in the field, and then after that they could go directly into processing. Um, we we put that in the greenhouse, and it sat in there from. September 20th until probably the middle of November. Uh, never touched it. it. I let it dry, we let the curtains down for the three, four, five days after that. We kind of raised the curtains up and left about a foot where some air could go through there. Uh, one thing we did do uh, after we put it in there, we came back and, and covered it with some, with some uh, cheesecloth-like material and to keep the sun from degrading it so much because we left it in there. If you were to take it out after whatever a week and go on and process it, you probably wouldn't have any problems, but we, uh, I don't know, some of the guys I sold to thought that maybe we would degrade that, that floral material, so we came in there and just covered it up with some with cheesecloth or whatever to keep the sun from, from being a direct, uh, uh, from degrading it or whatever. After that, uh, like I said, we piled in there. We went back to shelling corn and cutting beans. We got all the field work done, and we came in middle of uh, November and took, you can kind of see here, when it starts to dry up, about a third of the plant is just going to be stem. Then that floral material starts on about the top two-thirds of the plant. So the processors want all floral material, and... We're trying to sell pounds, so it's kind of a, a catch-22 in there. It's kind of like, I guess, cleaning how clean you want the corn in the combine. you got to sell a little bit, of, little bit of weed with it. But I took a sawhorse, and we wired hedge trimmers on the sawhorse like you buy at Lowe's, and, uh, and took that plant. Like I said, it's probably it's four or five foot when you put it in the greenhouse. It's probably three, three and a half when you, when after it dries down and it's been sitting there for two months. But we just took the plant and kind of held it in the hedge trimmer and cut the bottom half, two-thirds of the plant off, threw out the stems, and then took that, what was left, put it in a box like this, and ran it through a feed mill, like you feed cattle or hogs or whatever, just a New Holland feed mill. And we threw it in like you were throwing hay in it, ran it out the auger, we had bulk sacks like soybeans come in, held the sack up underneath it with a forklift, put seven, 800 pounds of sack, and, uh, loaded it in a semi and hauled it to town. So uh, in saying that, there's another, one of my neighbors had a swather and he took it and they cut it in the field, let it dry in the field and they walked in front of the swather and cut that bottom half or two thirds off with his swather and windrowed it. And he took a round bed and wrapped, they rolled it up and he stacked it in the barn and now they're taking it out of the barn and putting it through a feed mill and grinding it up. But, there's 
a million ways that, that people have tried to do it. And, and like Eric mentioned, there is no one silver bullet here to the industry. It's just kind of kind of waiting or, or trial and error. And, and whatever is a fact today is going to be fiction tomorrow. So what, it's, it's, uh, it's been really fun because it's, uh, for one thing, it was, we just had enough acres to kind of try it and see what was going on. It wasn't a huge deal. It wasn't a, a huge burden because of that. And so we've been able to do some different things and kind of try some things and, and uh, you know, maybe try to, to tweak it a little bit next year. Uh, but in saying all that, after you've done all that work and spent all that money, I'm, I'm going to guess that probably 10 to 15% of the people are going to get paid this year. So 85% of the people that did all that are going to have something to put in the sinkhole or fill in a gully or put in a ditch somewhere. And, it's, and if they don't, what was, what was something that we were able to get $11, $12, $14 a pound for is going to be something that this other guy is going to sell for a dollar because he can't get rid of it. And it's going to flood the market. We've already talked to the processors and things, and they said, you know, if you had 10 acres this year, we might raise two acres next year or something like that because they know they're going to be able to buy this from, from uh, those guys that didn't have contracts that came through. Just in our area, there's been several plants that are, uh, they had the money to get the plant started and then they canceled all the contracts in August and said, but guys, you just do what you want to with it, we're out. Uh, I know one, one group, I think they had all the tractors and, and pivots leased and stuff like that and they were down kind of a little bit farther towards Paducah and I don't think they've been able to pay anybody. So it's, when that cash runs out, it's, it's a sad story. So it's a, uh, one thing that I think is kind of neat, uh, well, one thing that might help the people, you know, I guess everybody's from Mississippi, Louisiana, Arkansas around here, but uh, one benefit to the hemp that I do think that a lot of people don't think about that I kind of emphasize is labor. Uh, but we've been able to take that labor, and I'm sure everybody else has got the same problem. We've got problems finding people to drive combines and planters and whatever. But we've been able to get these migrant workers, and if they're smart enough to get a visa, most of the time they're smart enough to drive a tractor, or at least some of them are. So we've been able to get some of these guys that do the, the manual labor. They've actually come up and been, been able to do work. We've got some of these guys running combines and, and planters and just whatever else. Uh, so that's... One, one of the good points about having the labor there on the farm, you can always find something for them to do, and, and it's, uh, I don't know. But, got any, good, yes, sir. What are all the reasons that it's testing the hot? It's just uh, genetics, number one. Uh, there's different plants that, that you plant. There was a, I planted an auto and a cherry variety, and I think that auto variety may be tested hotter than the cherry. Uh, the second reason is the time that we leave it out there. So that left that one strip out there. We cut the most of it on whatever, from September 15th to September 20th, somewhere in that time frame. That other I left out there to about the middle of October to let it mature because it was a longer maturing variety. And when I did, when they came back to test it, it tested hot. Now, what I forgot to mention was when we processed that, we cut that stem off and ran it through that feed mill. They, they only test the floral material, the bud. So when you take the rest of that plant and grind it up and put it in that bag, they came back and they tested that bag and said, okay, when they came back and tested it, it came back at point two or whatever like that because you had all that stalk and, and other, other material besides just the bud in there with it. So we were able to sell it. I think that, uh, correct me if I'm wrong here, the the THC level is not a big problem for the processors because when they, they're able to process it and, and take some of that out and then they add other things to it and dilute it so they get that level down. It's more of a um, the state state regulation and they're trying to make it, or it's federal regulation as well, that point three, but it's a... Uh, we, we can take it out, but it is a huge problem for us because it's marijuana. Yeah. By the, by the state law, so that's the, the thing we have to, to be to comply. So. But that's the leaving it in the field. I think is was what. Yeah. Do y'all have Do y'all have any kind of hemp, hemp breeding program? I know cannabis. They, you know, some of them are real high, some of them high quality. 
But is there anything for disease resistance? Now, that's a, and, and probably a, a bot, you know, she might be able, with ET, she might be able to speak, but there's a, a multi-state, it's project S1084, I believe, that a USDA project, and there's a lot of universities, and there's some, some breed, I think Larry Smart's a breeder, isn't he, yeah. and there, John McKay with Colorado State, so there's, there's some breeding underway, but we're, we're a ways out, and there's so many backyard breeders and uh, old marijuana breeders and and that uh, perception is just powerful now and so um, you know for the UT field trial we had three varieties they were all cherry and uh, we got them from three different sources and two they looked the same and one looked completely different so you can't tell I know for a fact of one variety that was doing well and somebody stole some cuttings and renamed it and so there's there's just so much going on out there but uh, I think it's coming um, uh, John McKay with uh, Colorado State I, I know there's a company out there called New West Genetics and they're looking at a direct seeded model where you got male and female plants and Canada is soon doing some of that too and they have a I think the country's first registered um, you know variety that's went through all the official hoops so it's coming uh, just uh, perception's got to jump on science right now. We got a lot of DNA checking you got my right. That's that's right and, no, and, and very good money for funding and that's been the challenge there's just no Monday, finally we can apply for grants, but there's just been no funding to fund that, that research. And we painted, you know, I painted, a, I gave an extension, more like an extension talk, because that's what I've done more of. I painted a pretty bleak picture, and I always try to get people, I don't want to talk anybody out of it that can do well, but I sure want to let people know that it's tremendous, tremendously risky, and, and you can lose a lot. But, uh, you know, for the people who, it's all about locating those people that can, can pay and good contracts that can pay you on delivery and then those people um, are gonna are gonna do pretty well but right now just the the processors and the market you know our company we we don't we don't have to give out many contracts to get all the hemp we need and so you know if there were hopefully there will be more processors like that to come on board that can uh, I would say too, if, if someone's interested in raising hemp and you go to a processor and they say, raise all you want, I would steer clear because I've had the most luck with people that said, okay, you can raise two acres or you can raise five acres that, and they know what their cost is going to be come September, November, whenever they have that. The guy that says, yeah, if you bring, raise 200 acres, I'll buy it from you. It's, I would say it's, a, it's a probably a 98% chance that that guy doesn't pay you. Going to be acres next year? No, sir. I think I'll probably have about a third of what I had this year because I don't think they'll. I'm going to downside it, other words. I don't think that the processors that I deal with will want to, to take that much hemp because they're going to be able to buy from the guys that couldn't sell their hemp this year. So, what's, what's a good yield or an average? So I think we made, came in somewhere around 800 pounds to the acre, uh, which I when we when we started out, I think they told us 1500 was going to be. That's kind of where they were shooting. Um, we, we came in about 1,800 pounds. I know a lot of people that were in the mid-2,500 or 2,500 pound range, things like that. And I think that all goes back to that genetics as well. Uh, one thing that, that uh, Eric's company did, they had, they had a block of growers and they gave, uh, they had 40 growers, they gave 10 growers this variety and 10 this one. They just kind of split it up so we could kind of learn to see what variety it's going to be the one that produces the most pounds and, and or produces the most oil and then keeps that THC content down as well. So it's a it's a huge learning curve because it's nobody knows. And we, there's a lot of moving parts and, and like I said, the farmer wants the pounds and the companies want the oil and the state says we gotta keep this THC level down, so we gotta keep everybody happy. We're not really pushing the space. I mean you saw it kind of the main thing for spacing is weed control now, so I don't think we're really pushing that spacing down so we're limiting the plant inside it. So uh, I, the UT trials this year in Greenville and Jackson and, and Springfield, 
you know, we may have some, but in general, uh, half a pound to two pounds of plant. And that, that had a lot to do with genetics and maturity and environment. With the tobacco, we, we normally, on the, on barley tobacco, we're probably 22 to 24 inches apart on plants. Um, dark tobacco, we're 30 to 34 inches apart on a plant, and, and we're selling pounds all we can get, and there's been lots and lots and lots of tests on that, and that's kind of the, the sweet spot for spacing. And, it, and tobacco plants get about the same size, and they branch out, and we're selling the leaves, and so, Spacing it out 60 inches, I don't think there's any problem with competition. I mean, you got that plant's doing all it can do. It's it's uh, definitely. When do you think you're gonna get funding? What's that? Are some of the private companies going fund. Is, uh, is any USDA money coming in to fund it? Or? I don't know what the latest is on the USDA uh, process. Last year, when I was with UT, we went to a meeting in New York and. Uh, there was encouragement to apply for those USD, USDA grants. You know, we've seen uh, an industry. We're not we're not big enough to provide big enough you know funding to do the kind of multi location, multi state research that needs to be done. But we've seen MT at Middle Tennessee State. They got about a million dollars a few years ago from a company I think out of Florida. Um, there was a company in Knoxville that at least they started out with a commitment. I don't know where that's at. They committed several hundred thousand dollars to hemp research, but uh, and the sum of the company lives were just so short lived. And uh, I mean, everybody's got their own agenda too. So funding is a is tough. But uh, I don't get this question. I don't know what time our next talk is, but I was going to tie it up. Uh, yes, sir. You have any clue what? Maybe a rough estimate of a ratio of hemp that's under plastic versus that's in the barrel. The plastic barrel. Um, so, I mean, that's my windshield. Out of windshield, I would say like uh, one in five. I was going to say 20%, so pretty close. Yeah, 20, okay, 20%. So we kind of agree from just guessing. And, and we got people this year that say, well, I'm, I had plastic last year, but I'm going to bear ground. We have people like vice versa, but uh, yeah. Some people that I've talked to, they've got to buy the grateful plastic. Other people didn't like fooling with it, but I'd say whatever works for you. Vegetable growers are pretty, pretty comfortable, whatever you're comfortable with. What were your varieties? Pardon me, sir? What varieties did you grow? I had an auto and a cherry. Cherry blossom? Yes, sir. I raised cherry blossom, a very blossom. I process it. We process it right there. The process that I had, we did it right there in the field. Oh, really? Yeah. He took it straight. Straight. They take the whole the, the whole plant. No. We cut the stems off of it. And yes. Sir. It through the thing that they do to process that. I got you. And uh, put it in uh, totes. Okay. Yeah. Well, I saw uh, another neighbor I had. They had a big machine came in on a like a gooseneck trailer. And it, it was like a combine, had a shaker pan, and they ran it through that, and it, it, it pulled that, pulled the butt off. And, and uh, But they had, they, the process, when they had, I think the processor just let them use the machine or whatever. Was it your, your name was and A-grade and C-grade? No, sir. It was all by the pound. They weighed it and said, you got this many pounds, and they paid you so much a pound for the, for the product. But the, we had to get it dry. Or if you took it straight out of the field, was, did y'all dry it in the field? No, no. We cut the plant, ran it through, ran it through. like an old time boss. Made that box of cheese. Yes. And the bugs come off. Huh. And they go into the top of the top. And then we put it in the refrigerator truck. And then we put it in the refrigerator truck. And then we now, was that for the oil or was that, was that smokable? For the oil. The big ones. Yes. I bet that worked out well. You got rid of it. Yeah, yeah. Did, you, did they pay you? But the price didn't come out to be that. They told you again. 
changes quick, doesn't it? <laughs> yes, sir. 